How about a Coppola Quick Facts? Uh, Coppola Quick Facts. Alison Lohman went to the audition dressed <laughs> and acted like a 14-year-old girl. And Ridley Scott only realized her real age when she told him. And she was 23 at the time that they were filming. She, yeah... She she passes us both. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's 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 a good actress, uh, and she played young. It's kind of sad that she stepped away from acting. Yeah, she retired um, in like two thousand nine. I think that was. Right. Yeah, it was like it was right after she did Drag Me to Hell. I think was one of the last projects she did. She might have yeah. done something after that, but yeah, she uh, she was kind of on the upward, and then I guess settled down and had a family and stepped away. So, but man, she is was, that she is that the story? It. Is she yeah? She stepped she married away from a family. director. Mm-hmm. My film director, producer, I can't remember which. And then they had like three kids. And so she yeah. just didn't want to do yeah. acting anymore. I also imagine Hollywood might be slightly different for younger women than younger actors. And I can yeah. see why some of them might want to step away. Oh, yeah. Especially I if you could pass her. as a 14 year old. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> I, don't, uh, I, don't, I don't blame her for stepping away. It's just, it yeah. sucks because I thought she was, I thought she was really, really yeah, good. Yeah, she was yes. really good. After Dragging Me to Hell, I was excited to see what she would do next. Yeah. And she's great in this film. Uh, yeah, I feel like she kind of steals the show in this movie. Yeah, she really does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, this one, whole thing wouldn't work if she wasn't believable. Yeah, mm-hmm, for so. sure. At one point in its development stages, before Ridley Scott was hired, Steven Spielberg was actually asked to direct, but he turned it down to do Catch Me If You Can, which is actually Interesting. one of my Another. favorite Steven Spielberg films. I, I love that movie. Another con movie. But I could definitely see Steven Spielberg doing this film. Uh, I think mm-hmm. he might have done a better job than even Ridley Scott. Um, but, you know, uh, he, he wouldn't have probably wouldn't have gotten Nicolas Cage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Has Cage ever worked with Spielberg? No. Uh, no. Doesn't sadly, like no. Sadly, no. that you'd get. I would love that, though. I would love to see Cage in a, in a Spielberg film. Yeah. I feel like Spielberg is getting to the point where he's probably going to be retiring soon. So I don't think we're ever going to see Nick Cage and Steven yeah. Spielberg together. <laughs> I don't know. I thought he was done directing a couple of years ago and then he's just kind of come back because he seemed to be producing more than directing. Yeah. And now he's come back in a big, bad way. I mean, geez, look at West Side Story. He's yep. lit yep. up the Oscars with nominations. I thought he was done after Munich. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. early 2000s. I mean, uh, I mean, I thought he, yeah, I thought he had, you know, he was on a downward spiral after Munich because, uh, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> but the uh, airport scenes um, that are set at LAX were actually filmed in the main entrance of the Anaheim Convention Center, a mile south of Disneyland. Oh, cool. I'm going <laughs> to be there in a couple months. Really? <laughs> yeah, for Star Wars celebration. Due to change security measures in the nation's airport, after 9-11, though, this because this was filmed in 2003, filming rights uh, have been severely restricted on airport property. So most of the time when you do see an airport these days, it's it's fake, you know, yeah. or it's in mm-hmm. a different location. I also and imagine made it's kind of hard to, like, just shut down an airport yeah. <laughs> just, just to film something. Shut down days. an entire terminal. I feel like that <laughs> movie, the, the Terminal, the Steven Spielberg film, I think was actually shot in an airport, but it was like a section that was being renovated or mm-hmm. something that makes like sense. that. Uh, this is Ridley Scott's first film for Warner Brothers since Blade Runner, which is kind of crazy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> like, so you made this movie for us that bombed. Yeah. All right, we'll give you one more chance. <laughs> we'll give you eight different this, this director's be- cuts of it, this though. This one better not bomb. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But I guess Blade Runner came back and became a cult classic, and I'm sure they've yeah. made a ton of money since. probably broke even on yeah. home video. Blade Runner mm-hmm. really or came into its own. releases Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, like, I think it, it came into its own when rentals became a thing, and then, um, like, home box office, like HBO, and... Um, mm-hmm. Cinemax and all those those yeah. types of uh, movie channels really kind of made it into a cult classic, and then it just grew and grew and grew. I feel like the same thing happened at Blade Runner twenty forty nine, where it's like it bombed, and then it's mm-hmm. becoming a huge hit, you know, huge cult classic, especially mm-hmm. for weirdo cinephiles like myself. Mm-hmm. That movie's such a fucking masterpiece. I love I think. it. Uh, this is the second Nicolas Cage movie to be composed by Hans Zimmer, um, the second of three, uh, as we said, The Weatherman, um, but also The Rock. I did not know that The Rock was done by Hans Zimmer. Um, 
So that'll That's be interesting. Score. <laughs> yeah. So huh. The Rock, Matchstick Men, and and The Weatherman. The Rock does not sound like Hans Zimmer to me at all. And just I've seen a lot of that movie lately because it's been on AMC. And anytime there's a Nicolas Cage movie playing on TV, I put it on in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> so I've heard As that score should. a lot lately. Oh, hell yeah, dude. <laughs> so I've heard that score a lot lately and it does not sound like Hans Zimmer to me. I remember it being, you know, like we've said, the uh, cookie cutter yes, Michael Bay is. score. Yes, um, it is. It'll I think Hans Zimmer's got the talent where he can just do that. Like if he could do whatever. If the director wants him to do a specific style, he'll probably just do it. I feel so like at the time he wasn't music? okay. He wasn't quite Hans Zimmer yet. That was 1996. <laughs> no. Yeah. So I yeah. feel like he kind of did whatever the director wanted at that yeah. point, which I think he still does. But I think he brings his own thing yeah. to it now. I think you know? the first time I ever heard of him was for the Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Yeah. I was going to say was his Pirates big breakout. Yeah, I, I think remember so. hearing his name in scores. Pirates, and then Batman is where I really yeah. got interested in him because the score he did for that first movie was incredible. Yeah, and then it just carried on, just kept getting bigger and bigger with uh, his Nolan collaborations. Yeah, to the point where he, his music just starts drowning out the audio in Nolan's <laughs> <It> films. <does. laughs> <laughs> there were some spots in Dune where it's like it's just like a <laughs> like here's a shot of like a hot air balloon going across the mm-hmm. desert and it's like like he's probably watching the scene he's like I have to make this interesting <laughs> it's so boring <laughs> uh, although the major con at the end of the film spoilers is in the uh, novel it was actually left out of the first drafts of the screenplay for fear that the audience would feel cheated. Like we said, <laughs> if the hero was left penniless, he's not a hero though. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. At the suggestion of director Ridley Scott, however, the con was put back into the screenplay and the last one year later sequence was added as a wrap up, which, you know, uh, if they would have ended it without that sequence yeah. at the end, I feel like you would have felt pretty bad for him. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, would have been a Schrader movie. Just <laughs> if, down if it would have ended with him <laughs> cackling on Heather's doorstep at the end, <laughs> uh, as revealed in the DVD director's commentary, Roy, Frank, Angela, and Frechette. Who's Frechette? Is that Chuck? That's Chuck. Okay, Chuck. Roy, Frank, Angela, and Chuck all smoke at some point in the film. This is a clue added by the filmmakers to indicate that the people who smoke in the film are con men. <laughs> ah, because they use matches to light the- ah. oh. There's also that shot of um, when he comes out of the fake hospital room and they're like, they've been playing uh, backgammon or Mm-hmm. One of the when it's like that little game with the sticks, they're yeah, all match sticks mm-hmm. in there mm-hmm. instead of it. like regular pins, which is I interesting. I don't know, that's what they were called. Uh, is it backgammon? Yeah, yeah, okay. that's a game. Yeah, yep. I didn't know that's what they called those stupid things. <laughs> I'm gonna hate that game. 